So welcome everyone to the research showcase. Um, my name is Ellery. I'm the data scientist here uh, on the research team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Today we have two exciting talks lined up. The first is on emergent work in Wikipedia by Ofer Arazi from the University of Haifa. And the second talk is by Charlie Kutschma, a UX intern at Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, we'll have sort of a five minute uh, Q&A after the first talk and an extended Q&A uh, after the end of the second talk. For those of you who are remote, uh, you can field your questions via IRC uh, using the channel Wikimedia-Research. And with that, over, uh, please take it away. OK, so I guess I'm uh, going first. I'll start by uh, briefly introducing myself. First, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the Wikimedia Research Showcase. Uh, I'm going to talk about emergent work in Wikipedia, and I'll no. share my screen now so you can see the slides. Okay, seeing the slides? Yes. All right, so the title of the presentation is Emergent Roles in Wikipedia. This is joint work with colleagues from Darmstadt in Germany, Johannes Daxenberger and Irina Gorevich, as well as colleagues from NYU, Ila Lipschitz Asaf and Odedno. Okay, and uh, this research is part of a broader research program into peer production. Some of the communities that we've been looking into, aside from Wikipedia, various open source software development projects, as well as citizen science projects, such as iNaturalist. Now, when I'm talking about peer production, I'm referring to community of volunteers that self-organize the co-production of knowledge-based products, basically any product that you can turn into ones and zeros, such as software, code, and uh, Wikipedia, and uh, other examples. Okay, so our objectives is to enhance the understanding of how self-organized co-production work is coordinated, and uh, have uh, my youngest boy is almost eight years old, and when he asked me, Dad, what are you doing? I'm preparing for this presentation. What is the presentation about? I told him it's about how Wikipedia works. So my boy said, why don't you just simply look it up in Wikipedia? So uh, maybe after this presentation, we can update the uh, Wikipedia entry as well. All right, why Wikipedia? Aside from Wikipedia success and being the exemplar of peer production, uh, for organizational scholars, Wikipedia is an, ex an exciting setting because of its radical openness. And when I say openness, I mean that anybody, even not being a community member, can go change the product, the product being an encyclopedic entry on a wiki page, and uh, publish it instantly. Uh, aside, of course, from few restrictions, you know, uh, page... Uh, protections and so on, but generally speaking, the co-production model is extremely open, more open than any of the uh, other examples that I've given for peer production. And, and if you look at Wikipedia's co-production, it is largely free from workflow constraints in the sense that there's no predetermined order for the activities. You can, you know, initially add content, content and then reorganize it and then add hyperlinks or do it in a different order, and tasks are not assigned to particular individuals. Anybody can pretty much do anything, again, aside from a uh, few exceptions like reverse and so on. So uh, this is why Wikipedia is so uh, interesting. Now, if I ask the audience, how would you explain coordination in Wikipedia and generally in uh, other peer production projects, some of the explanations that I'm sure you'll give and other scholars are given in the past have pointed to, for example, Wikipedia's talk page and the coordination that takes place there. Other scholars have pointed to Wikipedia's norms and policies as a key coordination mechanism. See a couple of uh, papers in this area. Yet others have stressed the importance of quality work, quality assurance. 
including uh, members of this research team. And alternative explanations have looked at the functional roles or uh, the special access privileges as a key coordination mechanisms. Now, all of these explanations are valid, yet in this talk, I want to look at a different line of explanation. And what you see in the slide is these uh, previous explanations. Okay, so although Wikipedia has an extensive set of norms and policies and the talk pages there and the special access privileges, if you look at the number of participants that are likely not familiar or not very familiar with the norms and policies and are likely not active in the talk pages, these are roughly 50% of the editors here. This is out of our data set, 52%. Uh, are non-members in the community identified through their IP address. And I would estimate that even some of the registered members are not fully aware of the norms and policies, they're not very active, maybe not even reading the talk page and uh, often do not have special access privileges. In terms of the number of edits or the amount of activity, roughly 40% of the activity in Wikipedia is performed by IP address. And I will argue that to a large extent, this work performed by IP address uh, contributors could not really be explained in terms of the uh, other lines of explanations that I've pointed to earlier. Okay. So how is work coordinated or this portion of the production work in Wikipedia coordinated? And when I say production work, our focus here is what takes place on the main namespace, uh, the co-production of encyclopedic entry. I'm well aware of the vast activity in other namespaces, but that's outside the scope of this particular study. So recently, organizational scholars uh, such as Farage and others have uh, described the co-production work as highly emergent and acted at the moment. Let me read you a short excerpt. The co-production process that evolves the knowledge artifact then is less predefined by the organizational structure and instead is one of generative response to proposals that change the content over time. While an approach that emphasizes organizational structures may provide general rules and context for this evolution, it does not capture the highly individualized, transient, and unstructured response to individuals of individuals to maintain co-production in a fluid environment. Okay, so in, if this really how work takes place, then how can people arrive at anything that is coherent, how then is work coordinated in such environments? And this is exactly our research questions. Can order organically emerge independent of those coordination mechanisms that I've described earlier? And then what could explain the emergence of that order? And to be more precise, when we speak of order in this particular research study, we're talking about a robust and stable prototypical activity pattern. So basically bundles of activities that contributors tend to make to get together. For example, a contributor may focus on copy editing task. Other may focus on restructuring the articles. And we refer to those prototypical activity patterns as emergent roles. Okay. So this presentation is largely based on a forthcoming paper at Information Systems Research, also a follow-up at uh, CSCW 2017, but I'm not sure that I'll have time to get to that uh, second part, so I'll uh, concentrate on this paper. And the figure that you're seeing now is actually where this presentation will arrive at the very end. I want to use it now as a teaser just to give you a sense of what this work is about. The title talks about turbulent stability and oxymoron, and we're seeing turbulence in some levels, stability in the others.
Okay, so I'll uh, redo this slide. Let me know if uh, there's a problem with the voice. So the title of this paper is Turbulent Stability of Emergent Roles and Turbulent Stability and Oxymoron. We see both turbulence and stability in different respects. And the figure that you see is the illustration with which I'll end this presentation, but I want to give it here as a teaser. And what we're seeing is on the bottom left in orange is an arrow representing time. And we're seeing two surfaces, one at period one, the second in period two. We notice that the surfaces are quite similar in their shape. Uh, the surface at period one is created by inflows that push the surface, forming mountains and then puncturing the surface and then the outflow. Afterwards, same with the, for the surface in period two, the inflows and outflows are different flows, yet the surfaces are very similar. Uh, so this is the uh, gist of the paper and uh, I'll explain the details as we go along. Okay, so in terms of research method, we looked at a thousand Wikipedia articles from the time of their creation until our cutoff in 2014 using a double stratified sampling that sampled articles from different topical domains as well as from different maturity levels in terms of the number of revisions, 250 articles up to 10 revisions, then 250 articles 11 to 100, another 250 101 to 1,000, and then the last category, over 1,000 edits. Altogether, over 222,000 distinct contributors. And when I say contributors, including those that have made only a single edit to articles in the sample, altogether over 700,000 revisions. Okay, data extraction procedures focuses on the type of activities, and we try to tag the activities. Here you're seeing an illustration for the article of Chicago, different content elements created at different revisions. The second part shows the revision history and assume that each one of the revisions was tagged with one and more edit types. And once we tagged the revisions, we're able to create profiles for contributors. And later we clustered those to arrive at what we refer to as emergent roles. So this is a brief illustration, some uh, additional details. The typology of Wikiwork, which we've used, lists th 13 categories from creating new articles to adding content, deleting content, fixing typos, rephrasing text, and so on. This is based on prior works. We did not create this typology. In terms of annotation, we started with a different set of 90 articles that initially had uh, over 34,000 revisions, multiple annotators, uh, students basically that help us in uh, annotating this, uh, this small data set. And we arrived at over 13,000 revisions with reliable annotation, reliable meaning full agreement by multiple raters. And we use this manual annotation set as the input for our machine learning algorithms. Uh, again, I'll very briefly go through this, I'm getting too much into the details, but the actual algorithm was based on the work, the prior works of two of the co-authors, Daxenberger and Gurevich, using the Raquel algorithm with random forest classifier. Performance is very similar to human performance. So after we were able to identify the, or tag, the 700,000 revisions in our data set, we created profiles for contributors. We assumed that a contributor can play multiple roles across articles, thus creating over 300,000 distinct contributor article activity vectors. And this is an illustration. Each activity vector is represented in terms of the proportion for each of the edits. Assume that the colors here represent different edit types. And this is a profile for one of the contributors using k-mean clustering algorithm with a Euclidean distance measure. 
And we use standard techniques to determine the optimal number of clusters, in this case, compactness, separation, optimal cluster quality, arriving at seven clusters. Okay, so once we've tagged the 700,000 uh, revisions in our data set, we then created profiles for each of the contributors having a distinct profile for each contributor in each of the articles it was active in. And the profile is represented in terms of the proportion for each of the activity types, as you see in this uh, illustration, different colors representing different edit types. This is a profile for one contributor in a particular article. Next, we cluster those profiles using k-mean clustering algorithm with the k between uh, 2 and 10. We determine the optimal number of clusters using standard techniques, compactness, separation, optimal cluster quality, as well as using Lange's machine learning technique for verifying that our clustering solution captures the natural clustering of the data. Okay, so the seven centroids of the clusters represent seven emergent roles. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side, the colors represent the 13 types of activities, and each one of these roles with the hats represents a different combination of bundle of activities from all round contributors, vandals, watchdogs, and so on. Some of them are based on multiple activities, such as all round contributors, and some of them are one dimensional. For example, vandals, most of what they do is vandalism, or the watchdogs that mostly correct vandalism. I'm not going to get too much into the details of these roles because I want to talk more about the general structural things rather. Uh, on the individual characteristics of, uh, of each of the roles. Okay, so once we identified the prototypical uh, activity patterns, we moved to analyzing individuals and their mobility. And what we found is that individuals are highly mobile. Uh, in fact, I would say volatile in their uh, movement in and out of articles. Analysis on a year-by-year -year basis shows that about 90% of those active within an article in a particular year were not active before, so they're new, and then only about 10 to 15% of them persist to the next year. So the attrition rate is extremely high. And even the few that do persist uh, their activity within a particular article over years, they usually change their pattern of activities, so moving from one emergent role to the other. And I won't get too much into the numbers, but by and large, we're seeing a high, extremely high level of mobility. This is an illustration for different uh, type of users. These are real Wikipedia users. One that was the first one with the blue hat was active in a single year, in a single article. The hat representing the type of emergent role, the numbers representing the articles that they've worked on. The second one with the orange hat was active in the first year on eight different articles, playing the exact same role in all those articles. And then the second year moving to yet a different articles, playing the exact same role. The third category represents people that uh, persist their activities within one article, yet switch roles. And then the fourth category is people that move between roles and articles. Okay, so this is what we've seen at the individual level. Now, in terms of the overall organizational level of overall structure, and when I'm when I, uh, referring to structure, I'm talking about the nature of emergent roles. So what we looked at is uh, different stages in Wikipedia's evolution. And you can look at this from many different lens. 
uh, but Wikipedia until the end of 2006 and from 2007 onwards is a pretty different organization in terms of the uh, special access privileges that were added. Here we see the graph of newcomers and many, many different angles. So we try to analyze, split the data set for the first period and the second period, and then uh, using the exact same technique, identifying contributors' profiles and then clustering them to arrive at the prototypical activity patterns. And we ask ourselves, will we receive the same set of emergent roles? And really, we expected to see a very different solution. One, because Wikipedia is very different in this uh, uh, two periods. Second, because those active in the first period are not the same users that were active in the second period. And third, if you played around with clustering, you know how sensitive it is to the algorithm's parameters. So we did not expect to see the same solutions. Yet this is what we found. Uh, here we're seeing the list of 13 activities and the seven prototypical roles for the first period in red border. And then the set of prototypical roles that we received for the second period. And you see that it is very difficult to distinguish the two clustering solution. And when we look at this, this is a striking result in terms of the level of similarity. Okay, so altogether, what are we seeing? Turbulent stability, highly turbulent individual level mobility, and then highly stable organizational structure. Now I can explain what the surfaces in the inflows and outflows represent. The first surface represent the clustering solution or the set of emergent roles for the first period. The mountains are the clusters, the pins in the center represent the cluster centroids or the emergent roles. Same for the second period. You can see that they're very similar. The inflows are the people that were active in this period. They push the surface and create a surface, and then the vast majority flow out of that surface at the end of the period. They do not continue. Only few participants continue to the second period. These are the dotted lines in different colors, blue, red, green. And even those that continue from the first period to the second period, they change their position, meaning they play a different emergent role. Okay. So how can we explain this if the large portion of the work is not coordinated by the mechanism that we've seen? How do we get this structure? The structure has to emerge somehow. There has to be some form of even implicit coordination that makes sure that this emergent role persists over time. So this is the puzzle that we try to explain. And others have suggested that the artifact serves as a key coordination mechanism. This is uh, Kevin Croston and his colleagues looking at an open source software development. Recently, they coined the term stigmergic coordination, which is a term borrowed from the insect world to, de to describe this type of uh, implicit coordinations. Actors are leaving traces of their action in the code in software development. Here it would be in their actions in the article, as they are reading and reflecting on the code written by others in order to take coordinated action. So if this is the explanation, we try to find evidence for this in Wikipedia. And um, how, how do you find evidence for artifact sent, sent coordination? Uh, we're looking for comments when a contributor would say, well, I'm looking that the article is in a certain state. It is missing references. Thus, I'm coming in and adding references. And we look at the comments that people can make when saving uh, changes to a page. And this is a qualitative study, and we were able to find some evidence for this artifact centric coordination. I won't go too much into the details because I know that uh, we lost some time. Uh, a second analysis that we performed looked at articles of different maturity stratas, and if articles at different maturity levels need different type of work, you would assume that the 
type of emergent roles that they attract would be different. And this is exactly what we're seeing, a different stages, different set of emergent roles that are enacted in those articles, providing yet another evidence for artifact century coordination. So this is pretty much in terms of the findings. What does this mean? Key discussion points. Why do people enact a role at a moment? Look at people's motivation. This is what we try to gouge at in the follow-up CSW paper. I won't have time to get into this. Second, is this type of emergent order good? Well, we believe that it is. We believe that if you look at other less successful communities, you would not see this type of stable structure. We believe that it entails effectiveness, but this is yet to be proven. And uh, other interesting discussion points uh, relate to the conditions under which stable emergent roles can emerge. And we have some ideas about what these conditions might be in terms of clear goals and visibility of activity. Again, I'll skip this for the benefit of, uh, of time. Uh, Ofer, we're yeah. running, due to the technical difficulties, we're running a bit over time. So if you could maybe wrap up in the next two minutes and we could move on to questions. Okay, I will. I'm just at the end of the presentation. So the key insight that we uh, get out of this study speaks to this balance between openness and closeness of system. And we've seen Wikipedia with a very open philosophy adding more and more restrictions as the years goes by with the uh, growth of the community and the threats to, uh, to content. And at least uh, our interpretation of the results is that given the right mechanisms, you can allow for openness and freedom and order will self, uh, will organically emerge. Okay, practical implications, some insight for people like yourselves working on the uh, design of the community, the design of the platform, also for business organizations looking to adopt the open principles and holacracy, the terms that is used now by uh, business people. Okay, so this is pretty much it. Thank you for listening and I'm uh, open for questions. Uh, thank you, Ofer. Um, since we're running a little bit short on time, um, let's save the questions for the end and uh, give Charlie a chance to present. Um, so, Charlie, if you're ready, um, you may start. You're, you're actually muted, Charlie. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. OK. Hi, I'm Charlie. Um, I did um, my bachelor's thesis at Wikimedia Germany, and now, I work, and now I'm doing an internship there uh, in UX design and research. And um, I would like to present my research, too, that I did on my thesis. OK. And I will be sharing my screen now. Hopefully that'll work. Uh, whoa, that's second. Can you all see it? Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so my research was on human-centered design. Uh, oh, no, I did human-centered design um, to figure out how to use and edit the structured data in Wikidata in Wikipedia, and primarily in Wikipedia info boxes. And um, yeah, and I developed a concept for that. And so what we wanted to do was to provide structured data, as I said, um, just like Commons, for example, provides uh, images for Wikipedia and its sister projects. In one centralized space, Wikidata was, is supposed to provide uh, structured data for Wikimedia projects, for example, in info boxes where the data is structured. And at the same time, we also wanted it to, um, to make it possible for editors on Wikipedia or other projects to be able to edit the data on Wikidata directly from there, 
without having to um, to go to wiki data. So it's more comfortable for them. And at the same time, this would also increase the editors on Wikidata, which would increase the data and So uh, the reason why we wanted to do this was that at the moment, the data in particularly, I was looking at info boxes is um, inconsistent, uh, which means that, for example, um, I looked at all the featured articles of Berlin and compared the data they used for population, for example, and it was um, inconsistent throughout every language Wikipedia. Uh, through every art article and um and this is something that could be resolved if um, there would be one centralized place where you would uh, update the data um and right and so it would make the inaccurate data also accurate because often it's not just outdated but um just entirely wrong or missing even and um, it would help, uh, especially small language Wikipedias, uh, which can't uh, maintain every single article that maybe a big language can, like the English or German Wikipedia. And it would be easier for them to have um, more quality data on their uh, articles this way. Um, and what I did at first was um, get uh, feedback from Wikidata, uh, Wikidata editors and Wikipedians uh, on the Wikidata project chat, which is like uh, Wikidata's village pump. And I asked some questions there, like uh, what would they, um, what exactly would they need um, if we would do something like make Wikidata be editable from Wikipedia or any other project, and uh, what I should be careful about, what I should avoid, and um, things that they really would want to see in there. And um, the responses I got were very mainly uh, that I should focus on Wikipedia at first and um, concentrate on the info box integration of the editing and also make it work with the visual editor. And um, then I, on, based on that, I did some research on what already exists. And uh, what I found was, um, that some communities uh, or some projects already change their templates in a way um, that makes them able to import data from Wikidata uh, into the info boxes. As you can see here, for example, is the template for um, telescopes on the English Wikipedia. And um, how this looks then when you look at uh, the wiki text is here you just in the end need one line instead of as you can see down here i took an old revision the um, all the lines before and so now every single like if if um if those templates would be updated throughout the different languages then the info box would only ever need this one line and it would always have this new and up uh, up to date data from wikidata this is how the info box looks um, on the English Wikipedia. Um, yeah, instead of every language having to input the data this way. Um, another thing I found was um, something that the Russian Wikipedia came up with, um, which is a way to not integrate the data, but to make uh, to be able to edit Wikidata. And this is a gadget they made um, where you can edit the corresponding item of the article you're on. You can't integrate the data in any way, but um, you can at least change um, entire statements or anything you want. Pretty much this tool is very powerful. Um, yeah, and so since this is, since everything we do is community driven, um, I wanted to do user-centered design because the community is obviously, um, yeah, the, the most important thing. And um, so what I did uh, was try to um, come up with personas that I can use. And I did this with Ludia, the product manager of Wikidata. We created pragmatic personas, which are personas based on experience and not research, because at the time um, I didn't have the resources or the time, like in the scope of my thesis to do this. 
And based on that, I created um, scenarios for these personas. And um, together with Lydia, we then formed uh, re requirements that uh, the that my concept would need or the tool would need then in the end. But um, requirements not only for Wikipedia in the end, but also for Wikidata, because there was also things to consider uh, for Wikidata, like we obviously didn't want to increase vandalism, for example, on Wikidata through this. And um, based on that, I then made some wireframes. And we then decided on one. And from that, I then made a prototype, which I tested in a usability test with uh, 10 people from our Berlin open editing session. And they and I made sure that I had various levels of um, Wikipedia and Wikidata editing experience. And um, yeah. And what I how this worked was I first let them explore the prototype a bit on their own. And then I asked them two separate sets of questions. One was actually solving tasks so they could um, so I could see how they use the how they use the mockup and um, how how they find certain functions. And the second one was after the fact, I asked them questions like, what went wrong for them and what worked well, what needs improvement, and so forth to find out, uh, yeah, to find out more. And then um, after that, I also uh, let them fill out a questionnaire, uh, which had uh, questions that asked them to uh, ask them about the level of editing experience and their comfort with technology and so forth, so I could better evaluate um, the data that I got. Um, and so now I'm quickly going to show you the prototype just so you have an idea of how it looked. Um, this on the left, you can see the actual info box in, um, in the visual editor when, when, when you're editing it. And on the right is my prototype. And I wanted to keep it as uh, toned down as possible because I didn't want to interfere with people who would not be interested in the Wikidata functionality. Um, so it is entirely possible to not make any use of it at all and just continue working as normal, uh, as, as before. Um, and so there are two main things that I did, which is first, there's the fun function of um, being able to import the data from Wikidata, as I said. And the other one is editing. So editing the respective item of the article you're on and editing the actual data on Wikidata. And um, those two things are completely separate of each other. They don't interact at all. Uh, they do interact, sorry, but they, they're, not, um, they're not interfering with each other. Yeah, um, and yeah, so the corner here, this triangle, mm, yeah, the little triangle in the corner is what um, you click to um, import the data from Wikidata. And then this field, which is usually Wikitext, turns into a normal string. And then that's, that's the data. And, um, but if you want to go to the edit mode, you need to go into this, um, corner here, the Wikidata logo. And um, yeah, so uh, we will do that. And what happens then is um, the sidebar opens. And the sidebar then um, has information about the item. So, but first I'll explain a bit what you see here. So um, this is already a field. The blue surrounded one is a field that already has the data from Wikidata. As you can see, it's not in Wikitext anymore. And the field name is grayed out on top. And the corner is now colorful. So the Wikidata corner is active in a way. Um, and on the side, then you can edit the references and qualifiers and the rank. Every, most of the things you could also do on Wikidata. And if you want to change changes, uh, save changes actually done to the item, you need to um, save it. Uh, in an extra step instead of just um, going to apply changes as you normally would. And this was this was also one of the measures we took to um, to not make vandalism too easy because if um, people could just change the item label, for example, by just going into the field that could have caused um, 
voluntary but also probably often involuntary vandalism by just people maybe not realizing the to what extent they're actually changing things um yeah and so if um if this gets uh, implemented one day then um then we're hoping that uh, what this will do is that the quality of the data in the info boxes will increase. And through this, uh, the, co the consistency of the data on Wikipedia can become better because it doesn't need to be maintained in so many different places at the same time. And uh, the other advantages, advantages is that it'll, it'll get um, editors to Wikidata and this will obviously make the data on Wikidata better, which in return will make the data in the info boxes better again. And this was only a very, I mean, this, there needs, there's way more research that I need to do and I'm actually currently working on it. And I also have not, um, in the prototype that you saw, I have not integrated the feedback I've gotten already from the user test. So this was the prototype that I tested with. And um, yeah, so there's um, loads of feedback that I got that I need to implement and um, then test again to finalize the concept so we so um so we have something to work with when we want to implement this um, tool then know it'll be a gadget beta feature <laughs> yeah that's um it are there any questions oh i need to not do this anymore uh one second there we go hello hi charlie i have a question yes um, so since we have a little bit of time um, and you uh, you said at the end of your presentation that you have not yet integrated feedback uh, from the user tests, uh, I wondered if you could um, tell us a little bit about um, the the kinds of feedback, particularly like some of the more, maybe what, what was the most important feedback or the most surprising feedback you got um, from your user tests? Um. Some of the most surprising was probably some of the most, uh, some of the stuff where in the end, where afterwards you think, wow, that's so obvious, and why didn't I see this? But for example, um, the those little triangles in the corner, uh, a couple of, or like, you know, I think like 30 or 40 percent of the users um, thought they were those uh, things you can click to drag the field to make it bigger, because that's actually how they look exactly, and I just while coming up with it, I never thought of it. So I had people sitting there trying to drag the field and not actually clicking it, which is super obvious when you think about it, but um, didn't come up with that at that time. And another thing was the Wikidata logo in the corner. Many users thought it would take them to the page, to the wikidata.org, or maybe to the item, but they, they were actually kind of too scared to click it and didn't really indicate at all what, what could happen if you click it and um, that's something I need to change, there probably needs to be a better symbol or maybe a short word or something that explains what happens. Um, so those kind of things, for example. But um, some positive feedback that I got was also that um, the most of the users were very clear on um, if they're currently still uh, in their old info box in a way, so being able to manually input wiki text, or if they're actually um, using the data from Wikidata right now, so it was not, so um, what I called it in my thesis was the locality, so they were aware of uh, how, what's going to happen to the info box in a way, so that was communicated clearly, at least. Yeah, those are some two, three examples. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, maybe Offer wants to answer some from his talk. So I do have a, a question from IRC for uh, Offer. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's from uh, Pine. Um, uh, he asks, uh, uh, does the research provide any insight into, uh, one, how users get the information they need to be to be productive from the very first edit, 
or two, how to increase editor retention? Uh, okay, so uh, two interesting questions. I'll start with latter uh, about editor retention. So from this uh, particular study, uh, we have less information about why editors choose to sustain their participation over time. There has been quite a bit of research on uh, editors' motivations, Aaron, you're probably aware of it, and other people as well. In the follow-up CCW paper, what we did, we looked at a different data set where we had both information about uh, people's motivations at the very early stages, just as they joined Wikipedia, newcomers, and uh, linking that to information about these emergent roles. And what we're seeing is that people that are uh, tend to uh, remain active within a particular article over long periods of time are more motivated by intrinsic motivations. The ones that move around articles and emergent roles are more motivated by extrinsic factors such as uh, reputations and uh, peer pressure and so on. So insights more from the follow-up study, not from this uh, first one. And then the first question was about, just remind me. It's uh, how users get the information they need to be productive from the very first edit. Okay, so uh, interesting. So we don't know how people get the information they need. What we know is that a lot of people uh, do not look at Wikipedia's norms and policies and do not look at the talk page, but I have a sense of what needs to be done. I think that uh, the reason is that the what the end product should look like and that is an encyclopedic entry. As readers, we have a very good idea. And that is one uh, factor that contributes to, to knowing what to do. And the second one is the visibility of the artifact itself. You can look at the article, and if you like, you can look at the history and compare revisions, and you have a very good sense of what is the current state of the article. So it's like if I walked into a class and I told the students, why don't you arrange the tables in a U-shape, I don't need to tell them exactly what they need to do. They know because they know what the end state should be, and they can see what each other is do doing, and then they'll see. They, they know what they expect, what it should look like. They see some deficiencies, and they just go on to correct it. I'm hoping this answers. Okay, so I have uh, one more for Offer and one more for uh, Charlie, um, since the one for Offer came in first. Um, so this is from uh, Padge's uh, PAJZ. Uh, I may have missed something, but is there any indication that classes have changed over time? Uh, in other words, uh, using your data set, when you look at the data over time, would it be possible to look into whether new roles have emerged over time, or have you looked into this and are aware of studies of that? So there are very few studies that have looked at these emerging roles or structural signatures or prototypical activity patterns. And uh, I think ours is the first study that looked at it over time. And the evidence that we have that they don't change over time is by performing the same analysis independently for one period and then for another period. So the vectors that went into the clusterings for the first period are not the same vectors that went into the clustering in the second period, yet the results of a striking resemblance. Uh, and again, this is, this is not something that we anticipated. OK, so uh, this question is for Charlie, and it's from Inali. Um, were you looking to how to handle edit conflicts or potential edit conflicts? Um. That's actually something I didn't look into, but that's a really good point, <laughs> uh, which I will write down for uh, for now the next coming upcoming month when I will continue my work. And um, but the good thing is there are way less edit conflicts on Wikidata than on Wikipedia, so um, so, so that's that's something. <laughs> yeah. 
it should happen less often, I assume. Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's a good, uh, it's a good point. So Ellery, I have a couple of my own questions, but we've taken a lot from IRC land. Uh, are there any questions from the room? Maybe some of your own? I suppose the room is just you so far. Right, yeah, not from my end. We have three minutes left, so I saw that you had some questions in the IRC. Do you want to take a stab at them? Uh, sure, so so uh, this question is from uh, uh, me. Um, so so uh, when you uh, offer, when you were looking at um, article maturity level, I thought it was interesting that you decided to use the, the number of edits in the history. Um, and I was curious why you didn't instead look at like a measure of quality uh, for its maturity level. Well, OK, it's, so this is yet another valid approach. And if I wanted to look at uh, use the quality metrics in Wikipedia's internal rating system, I would have to have articles where there are a number of different, uh, you know, uh, quality ratings over time, and I'm, I'm not sure how many articles, uh, you know, have this series of quality ratings that have changed over time. Um, and I, th I think that the other studies in the past have also used the number of edits as a proxy for maturity. And this has allowed us to sample articles of different categories and uh, so on. I mean, like, do, do you have an idea of how you how you would create a sample of uh, articles with many different quality uh, scores? So, um, uh, well, I, I didn't intend to be here, but now I'm pitching a data set that I just published, um, <laughs> which is a data set that has, uh, so we, we built a high quality classifier of article quality in uh, Wikipedia, and then used that quality classifier to make assessments for every article on a month by month basis. And so I just threw a link for that data set in IRC. I'll actually throw it in the chat here too, so that you can uh, find that later, but that seems like it might be a useful way to do this. But I definitely understand this problem of like you don't know when the assessment is coming, so you don't know exactly when the article quality changed. This data set should hopefully uh, help people to get past that. Um, but but um, you know if I could narrow down in on my question a little bit, um, the reason why I wanted to ask is I was curious, you know, what sort of like the the um, foundation of using uh, edits uh, uh, as like a notion of maturity, like how that fits into you know this abstract notion of maturity, um, and maybe we can take that offline because I've already spent a long time on this question. Um, but yeah, I'd like to talk about that more later if we could. For sure. Great, so, um I think that we're at time. Um, thank you, uh, Ofer and Charlie, for presenting. And thanks, everyone, on IRC for uh, participating and submitting your questions. And we'll see you uh, probably next month. Okay, thanks. thanks. Thank you, Ofer and Charlie. Thanks, Ellery. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>